wo es hingeht. Steven, welcome. Hey everybody, how many people here have heard of S&D? Not as many as I hope, but that's okay. So S&D has been around for 37 years. Um, it's a global organization, started in 1979. It's been a really busy last couple of weeks for me personally. We had our print competition um, held in upstate New York with about 10,000 entries that we had a group of judges look at. And we just got done with our digital competition as well. There were 800 entries in that. We get them from all over the world graphics, page design, photography, you name it. And it's beautiful work, and I'm just excited to be here and to kind of showcase for you some of the best stuff that I saw. Um, and along the theme of, you know, what is the future of data visualization, I think one thing that you'll detect here pretty quickly is that there will be a lot of echoes to what Nigel, what Jen, what Paul were talking about earlier today. Um, that's as much a testament to the work that you see as to the instruction that they've been giving and the influence that they've had on graphic designers around the world over the last 30 years. Uh, the vocabulary that Nigel spouts earlier today is stuff that I heard over and over again at the, at the judging as well. It's the standard um, for what we do. And there's a, there's a growing level of excellence and seamlessness that you see now uh, with narrative and with uh, integration of graphics, especially in the digital. Um, and in fact, it's a really exciting time to be involved in data visualization. Maybe not in traditional legacy uh, newspaper and media companies, um, but there are a growing number of websites that are well-funded, that are hiring people, uh, at least in the United States, um, and that are having a big influence because there's a, there's a growing respect for the role of data visualization and data analysis. If the role of journalism is to uncover truths that are hidden from the public, then editors are discovering that not only the traditional reporting methods, but analysis, careful analysis of data can be a very strong way to get at that. And websites like 538, for instance, uh, taking a look at, there's a, um, there's a bit of a uh, to-do in the United States right now about the Oscars. Uh, actors and producers, directors of, of color, are traditionally shut out of the Oscars, and there are actually uh, statistical reasons why this is the case. And websites like this are shining a light on some of the hidden truths, some of the things that we may suspect to be true or that are urban myths um, and we want verified. So in terms of themes that I've seen in the last several weeks, um, the idea of using data and within your storytelling to convey emotion and looking for data points that can actually hit on those themes. Um, also creating immersion for the reader, the idea that data is not something to be looked at, but to be experienced, and stories themselves are to be experienced, is a growing theme. And then clarity, bringing clarity to everything you do, editing very carefully. I want to take these, I'll go through them really quickly, just kind of in reverse order here. Um, and showcase some examples that I've seen and, and some of the quotes that I collected from the judges. And one thing I wanted to mention, I have this presentation. Um, there's links all along the bottom here. I'm happy to share PDFs with you or I can give it to Michael Stoll. If anybody's interested in, in holding on to this, you're more than welcome to. Um, so there's an idea in print that the news hole is shrinking and we need to edit very tightly in order to make everything fit. It's the same online. That mentality needs to uh, be applied to online graphics as well. The idea that we have a lot of data but we want to spit it all out at the public doesn't help anybody. We need to think of the audience first and think of the points that we're trying to make. So what is it that we need to edit as we're going through our data? It's not just the data, it's the entire story experience. Every single decision that we make as we're presenting a story needs to be discussed, needs to be thought through in terms of the reader, and it needs to be thought through in terms of where the reader is going to get their information. Is it coming from print? Is it coming from a desktop? Is it coming from mobile? Is it coming from YouTube? There are all kinds of social media channels that are growing exponentially, and those, that, those places are where the readers are today, and we need to meet them there. Here's a nice example from The Guardian recently. This is a... Uh, an investigative piece that they did about a 
a uh, police detainee center in Chicago that was uh, not very well known. And the Guardian did a lot of data analysis to look at just how many people were being collected and held really against the law and against their rights in this place. And as you scroll through this presentation, it'll quicken up here a little bit, you see that they're making just one key point on each page. So every time there's a transition, you get to one key number to reach. And there, we saw a lot of people represented by pixels. Uh, that's kind of become uh, maybe a little bit of a cliche. But the quick transitions here and the simplicity of the presentation and the power of just making a single point with what you're doing is a way to move people through quickly. Editing is the main skill. That is something that never changes. If you can show that you know how to edit and you know how to arrive at a story and keep the narrative clear, you will always have value in a newsroom. An interesting startup site uh, last year called The Marshall Project. This is privately funded. They only have a dozen employees uh, working for them, and they are specifically geared towards social justice issues. Um, so here's a case where they're looking at the death penalty and some of the differences in how death penalty victims are treated versus how we treat our pets in the United States, for instance. Um, they set it up as a little quiz here. If you want to euthanize your pet, you're going to have a doctor involved. Is a doctor always involved when we uh, produce the death penalty for an inmate? What do you think? Here's the quiz. You guess the answer? It's pets. Pets get doctors, inmates don't. Uh, and here's a way to introduce the data as you go through. Uh, another graphic from The Guardian. This is looking at measles. In the United States, there was a big outcry last year about vaccinations. A lot of people are uh, kind of fundamentally opposed to the idea of vaccinating their children. And here's a graphic that demonstrates what happens and how something like the measles can spread very quickly through a population when you do not vaccinate. And here's the different levels. It demonstrates the different levels as well. So there's clarity here in the storytelling. There's simplicity in the numbers that they're trying to convey. Um, I won't use simplicity, clarity in the numbers that they're trying to convey. Immersion, heard this word over and over again. You have to honor the visuals. But what we're seeing here too, and this is a really exciting development online, is that storytelling is becoming much more immersive. It is becoming something where illustrators and photographers can now bring their stories to bear. The idea that online storytelling consists of a long narrative with visual adjuncts of photography, of graphics off to the side is no longer the case. And there's a lot more seamless storytelling taking place and nice integration of photography, of graphics, and of illustration as well. We need to think of phones first. Uh, here's a really compelling case for the idea that most people are now getting their information here. And there are different ways that people scan data through their phones that they do through a desktop. In fact, they don't scan it. They click through it. They tap through it. So keeping those points in mind as you're going through your presentations and, and talking about how to tailor them to the individual data, how to make them responsive if you're working on a phone, for instance is important. It's an important consideration. So the idea of creating an atmosphere for the reader, a, a, a full storytelling experience where there's immersion and there's also annotation is crucial. You want to give people the, the option to take a deep dive with data if they're very interested, or if they just want to scan and be amazed at some of the wizardry that you can produce for them, you want to give them that option as well. A New York Times piece looking at the moons of Saturn and the way that they were mapped uh, gives you the option to scan over as many as you want, look at them in three dimensions. Uh, if you're not interested in this, it's something you can just be, again, just kind of amazed by the wizardry without having to go further into it if you don't want to. Immersion is taking a lot of different roles, and there's a lot of new tools that are uh, being developed for online storytelling now that are really exciting as well. This is the best in show that we gave recently to the New York Times uh, for their 
uh, piece on refugees. And uh, these are three profiles of individual re war refugees. Um, and it's a beautiful showcase of how photography, how narrative storytelling can be used. And it's also an introduction to virtual reality. So there's a device called a Google Reader that you can buy for about eight bucks now. And you can go to the Google store to pick that up. And here's instructions on how to actually use this thing. And what it does is when you wear this thing, you're actually fe you actually feel like you are in the place uh, talking and listening to these uh, refugees that they're talking to. So you put on your little reader, and away you go. And I have to admit, when I did this, um, the technology isn't quite there yet. It's, it makes you a little dizzy. But it allows you to go look up, look down, look, basically walk into the same room as one of the people that they are profiling and have them come and talk to you. So here's a little boy in the Ukraine sharing his story. And that's the schoolhouse where he grew up. And you get a look at the ruins where he now lives. There's text that pops up to annotate as you're going through it. Again, it's not all the way there yet, but it's chilling to, to actually feel like you are in the place of these people as opposed to reading it just on a printed page. And that's kind of where emotion comes in. So the most compelling work that we've been looking at for the last several weeks, it breaks the molds. It, it doesn't just tell a story and annotate. It actually takes you places. And it allows you to break story forms and, and to think of narrative storytelling as an all-encompassing thing and not just words plus. And it comes back to that question of what is data? It's not the numbers, it's the experience. And it is about, pretty much about humans. Uh, most data is going to be representational. And Jen talked about this earlier as well, and, um, and Paul as well. The, the idea of taking data and comparing it, using it to make like comparisons for people. Because we do not think in numbers. Um, yeah, Frederick mentioned earlier how everything in his country is measured. I can tell you, in the United States, people don't know how to do math at that level. There was a, there was a study done recently where three-quarters of Americans cannot figure out the price of a rug if you give them the price per yard and the number of yards that they want. They cannot do that kind of math. So we don't come from a very sophisticated numerological society in the United States. We have people like Donald Trump as part of the symptoms of that. And um, as part of it, we need to tailor our presentations for people like that. It's interesting, you look at a person like Donald Trump. Uh, his language has been analyzed using data analysis. He speaks at a third grade level. Uh, there's a lot to be said for using data to actually shine a light on where people are coming from and the type of information they are trying to convey. Okay, so it's not about numbers. It, just telling people that there are 300 gallons of water produced each week uh, or, or used each week by somebody consuming grapes isn't enough to make a comparison that's going to be meaningful. However, when you put it into a fish tank and you use th that type of water to, to show the comparison, it actually makes sense. This is a story about the California drought. It's been going on for almost two decades now. And every American is actually contributing to this drought because most of the fruit and a lot of the produce in the country is produced in California. And it takes an awful lot of water to produce these types of, uh, these types of products. So how much water does it take to produce a couple glasses of milk, for instance? 
143 gallons, which you may not appreciate, but when you see that it's a kid's swimming pool, you actually get the comparison and it makes sense. So using data as a way to inform your comparisons as opposed to just presenting the data in and of itself can be more meaningful for people. I thought this was a really beautiful um, maybe next step in what Yuli was just talking about with data visualization and non-narrative storytelling approaches and taking an illustrative approach. This is a story about a atheist, an atheist who was talking to her daughter about why there have not been any atheist presidents in the United States. Her daughter's nine years old and she asks her, um, she asks her, why hasn't there been an atheist president? So you're scrolling through. How about you become the first atheist president? It's a conversation with her daughter. She's explaining what an atheist is. And then this sets up just a real quick piece of data here about how many presidents have actually said that they were atheists. And it gets back to the story. So pretty seamless. This is, from a, uh, this is from NPR, National Public Radio. They do beautiful online presentations. And this is about climate change. And it starts with wonderful photography and sets up the story that way. So instead of talking about the number of acres burned in Brazil, they actually go on the ground and talk to the people who are destroying the rainforest and ask them why and how much they actually depend on uh, burning the land in order to survive. It sets it up with beautiful photography and this sort of immersive storytelling before you get to the data. So how bad is it? It's not that the earth is in danger, it's that humanity's in danger. So who's burning the rainforest? It's actually not who you might suspect. It's not big companies. It's just small subsistence farmers like this woman. And why does she do it? She's trying to eke out a living. She says, you either burn or you starve. So they've created that emotional connection already for you. And then us as moralistic Americans decry the burning of the rainforest. But in fact, it happened in the United States as well. There's the rainforest back in 1620 compared with 1920. You can see how tight the storytelling is before they launch into the graphics. And what you see and appreciate is that the graphics that they use here, they're necessary to take the next step in the storytelling. So here's the annual deforestation rate in Brazil since 2004. Looks like conditions are improving. And Brazil is getting praised for this. Unfortunately, the data can be misleading. Here's a case in point. Here's the cumulative loss in rainforest. So not just presenting hard numbers, but actually putting data into context is very important as well. And this, I think, was probably the most gripping example of how to create emotional connections using data. This is from Pinellas County, which is actually pretty close to where I live in, in Florida. And a study from the Tampa Bay Times found that uh, if you are going to be a black person living in the state of Florida, Pinellas County is the worst place to live. Why is that? Pinellas County has four times as many students as the other poor places where black people tend to live. And Pinellas County was much better off in 2007 when they start this comparison in terms of segregation of the schools. You can see that the schools are pretty integrated at this point. However, in 2007, the school board in Pinellas County abandoned the integration. And you can start to see what happens here. Five schools within this county change the most. They become outliers out here. A little more segregated, a little more. 
until they became extreme outliers. So you've got a big separation here between mostly white students and mostly black students happening. That wasn't the case just 10 years ago. And why is that a problem? Because they also, the black schools tend to become less equal. Students begin to fail at these schools. They're not as well funded. Here are those schools in terms of failure rates. Students passing reading and math. These are the students from those black schools. You can see that they're worse than any schools in the states. Ten schools in Florida have similar failure rates. However, most of them are poorly run private schools or schools that are specially set up for kids with disabilities or behavior problems or a non-traditional early learning center. And when you take those kind of exceptions away, what you end up with are the, those five schools in Pinellas County which are serving their students the, the least. Hundred and sixty students in those schools took state exams. This is from one school, Melrose County. Hundred and fifty four of the students in that school failed either reading or math. Only six students passed both of those tests. This is what I'm talking about why we don't have a lot of very smart people in the United States. We don't educate our people very well. And one reason we don't is that we discriminate and we send people of color to different schools than white people and it ends up dividing the society and we end up with problems in our society because of that. Data analysis like this can actually shed a light on something like that. The idea that you could find this story in the traditional way by putting reporters on the ground and going out and interviewing people isn't the case. You needed the data to discover this story. And once you get at something like this, you can launch into a much bigger investigation and start asking state officials, why is this allowed to happen in the 21st century in the United States? This presentation that I just showed you here, you can see it was, I think, 15, 20 slides here, was a precursor. They actually ran this presentation online before they ran the series of stories. And it's a great example of how you can use data analysis to set up your, your storytelling and your narrative as well. So in terms of the trends and kind of the future of data viz, this is where the industry is going. And I saw a bunch of people kind of raise your hands earlier when you were asked if you were just designers. There's nobody in this room who's just a designer. We are all storytellers, we're all journalists, and we all have to be curious about the world. And when we are, it can lead us to really wonderful examples of ways that we can change the world and kind of showcase uh, where paradigms need to shift in the world. So I will wrap it up at that. And I didn't get the cards waved at me. You wave the cards at everybody else, but not me. <laughs> Feel left out, but thank you very much.